in this section I would like to give you basic information about this session. The purpose of this session is to introduce you STM32 Cube IDE tool. Its installation process we will focus on Windows platform, its basic configuration and first run. During the first run we will toggle one of the LEDs present on the board. The next purpose is, uh, is to demonstrate to you the main components of STM32 Cube IDE Device, con device configuration, code processing, and project debugging. Within this session, we have prepared some set of examples using HAL, so hardware abstraction layer, and low layer libraries. Let's talk about the prerequisites for this session. The first and most important one uh, is, of course, the PC with uh, pre installed STM32 Cube IDE software and uh, STM32 G0 Cube library. We have selected STM32G0 71RB microcontroller as a, uh, to practice during this session. This is why this library is a key uh, to allow us to generate the code and uh, prepare some set of examples. From hardware point of view, you would need uh, one Nucleo board. It is called Nucleo G0 71RB. You can see it on the screen. And one micro USB cable which allow us to connect this port to, the, to your PC. Complete list of prerequisites and a link to all of the materials, slides, uh, exercises, hands-ons, you can find on the dedicated web page for this session. A link to this web page I have put to, within the description of this video. More information about our other STM32 devices, other tools, you can find on a dedicated web page which is uh, which contains all the information about our training materials. You can easily find it on the on the web using this address www.st.com slash stm32 education and within MOOC section you can have a look on a complete set of available training sessions. I will start from standard ST web page. This is uh, our current ST web page. Let's go to mentioned web page with the of trainings www.st.com slash stm32 education if I will scroll down I can see uh, some additional icons which I can select you can find here online trainings which are theoretical trainings for all of the other our stm32 products Let's have a look what's what we can find here. You can find here some set of uh, online trainings, theoretical trainings uh, for STM32 F7, STM32 L4, L4 Plus, uh, G0 and WB microcontrollers. Let's come back to our um, previous page. The other icons represent other areas which could be interesting for you. The next one is so-called MOOC, Massive Open Online Courses. This is the area where we, we place all of our online trainings, which contains some set of examples as well and hands-on sessions. Those are hosted at the moment on, YouTube, on our YouTube channel, so there is, it is quite easy access uh, to them. If you click on this icon, you will see the dedicated page for our, on our online courses. You can find here five different groups of trainings. Basics, STM32 tools, STM32 lines, applications, and tips and tricks. You can start from basics if you are new uh, with an STM32 world. Then you can find some dedicated sessions about STM32 tools. Then, uh, if you are interested in the STM32 uh, lines like L4, F7, uh, G0, L0, you have uh, some set of uh, dedicated training sessions of those microcontrollers. Then within applications, uh, we are presenting some dedicated sessions on uh, LoRa, graphics, motor control, USB, uh, so dedicated areas of microcontrollers usage. Within tips and tricks, you can find um, uh, some selected topics uh, which could be interesting for you within microcontrollers world, like ultra low power handling, um, dynamic uh, tools and in application programming or security basics. This uh, list uh, is quite dynamic. Uh, we are adding more trainings 
each month so please visit it regularly uh, to be up to date all of the sessions right now are hosted on our ST Micro Electronics YouTube channel. This page and its sub pages, because here you can see the links uh, to each session, contains main information about the session, its prerequisites, uh, links to the materials which can be useful for you uh, to do the session. So if I click on this STM32 Cubemix training, uh, you can see a dedicated page when you can find basic information about the session, its outline, its agenda, a list of the prerequisites, software and hardware, and you have you have the link as well uh, to access the course. If I click this link, I'm landing on the dedicated page uh, with the playlist of this session. So you can see here under the video, I'm repeating the basic information about the session. You can see the set of uh, videos for this particular training. OK, let's start our adventure with STM32 Cubemix. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part I would like to introduce to you the board which we will use during this session. It is called Nucleo G071RB. You can find the name over here. It contains its own programmer debugger called stlink v2.1. This is this top of the board. Below you can find a dedicated board for the microcontroller. Our microcontroller would be stm 32 g 71 rb t 6 64 pin microcontroller from STM32 G0 family. This is the central chip on the board. On the board, you can see as well some additional components which would be useful for us. Some buttons, LEDs, a jumper to measure the current consumption, some connectors which allows us to connect other components. Let's have a look on the components which you will use during this session. On top, you can see the Estherlin programmer debugger. It can be connected to the PC using this CN2 connector using micro USB cable. This is the main chip for the S-Link. Below you can find a board for our microcontroller with the microcontroller in the, in the center. Blue button is so-called user button. It is connected to pin PC13. We will use it uh, to test the external interrupts. The black button is a reset button, which allows us to reset the complete application. On board we have as well the green LED, it is located on the right side of the reset button. This green LED is connected to PA5, we will use it to indicate some states of our application. Once we connect the board to the PC using micro USB cable and this CN2 uh, connector, a Stelling driver will be installed on our PC. If the driver is properly installed, after the connection of our Nucleo board to the PC, we should see LD1 red LED on, which if it's blinking, it means that there is a problem with a driver installation or the board is not yet detected by the system. Thank you for watching this video. Welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this video, we will do the first hands on. The objective of this lab is to create the project using STM32 Cubemix and HALA libraries, which would allow us to toggle green LED, which is connected to PA5 pin on our Nucleo board. Here you can see the part of the schematic of a Nucleo board which we are using in our exercise. Our LED is called LD4, it is green LED, which is connected to pin PA5, what you can see on the, on the screen. Let's open the Cube IDE application. The first thing we need to do after run of this application is to select the location of the workspace. I would select the different name just to start everything from scratch. 
in my case it will be C then underscore work and subfolder cube ID but with number three. I launched the application and the workspace is empty. There was no project inside uh, the workspace. It doesn't contain any project. We can see this information center welcome uh, screen and we can start a new STM32 project. So I select this icon. So the first thing is to select the micro we would like to use for our project. Take some time. So this is the target selection window. We have three options here. Either we will select the particular part number, MCU, MPU, or we will select one of the ST boards, which is equipped with um, STM32 devices, or we will select the cross selector, selecting uh, some ST competitors and uh, try to run similar project on STM32 devices. We will select the MCU, MPU selector, just to do everything really from scratch. And uh, we need to select our micro. In our case, it is STM32G071RBT6, part of it, because STM32 is existing in all of the products. I'm starting from this G071RP. I can see one choice, RB, I selecting this, uh, this part number. So we see two of them. Uh, we are selecting LQFP64. Uh, package because this one is located on our nucleo port. Once I highlight this number, I click next on the bottom of the page. And the next step is to specify the project name we would like to create. Uh, here you can see the default, lo default location of the workspace. And within this workspace, we will have as well the location of the projects. I would call my project as a g0 underscore LED and uh, I have some options to, to be selected. By default it will be project C project and the binary type it would, it would be executable and the project type it would be STM32 cube based. We can select as well C++, we can select the static library which can be reused in other projects and we can select as well the project type as empty but in this case uh, we will have just an empty skeleton of the application and uh, we need to define our set of the registers, register map by ourselves. In our next videos you will see the project generation using this empty project type so you can follow this part as well. Let's continue with the project setup using STM32Cube. Let's press next. On this window we can see the micro we just selected, the version of the library we will use. So in our case, it will be cube for g 0 version 1.2.0, and the location of this library. So in my case, it is C underscore work and subfolder underscore cubemix. Below, you, you see as well the uh, link uh, to the configuration window where you can configure the repository location for your libraries. In this window, you have an option to select the code generator options. So either you will copy all the necessary library files uh, to the location of your project, or you will use it as a reference to the original files. We will use the default settings. Copy only the necessary library files. Okay, let's press finish. Uh, as a result, we can see some information window about uh, the perspective change. Within uh, Eclipse environment, you can have a set of so-called perspectives. So this is the configuration of the window set, which is present on the screen. Within STM32 Cube IDE, uh, we've got at least three main perspectives. The first one is so-called CC++, which is used to uh, edit the code, uh, perform the compilation uh, of the code. The second one is so-called STM32 Cube MX or device configuration perspective. And the third one is a debug perspective, which is used to uh, debug the application. So I would just click remember my decision and yes. So now it is starting device configuration part of Cube ID software. In case you have not downloaded the STM32 G0 Cube library, it will be done automatically as you can see on my screen. So the application will connect to the repository, the web page, the proper Cube library will be downloaded as a zip file and then unzipped uh, in the folder we just specified two steps before. 
we need to wait a bit uh, to uh, download and unzip the complete pack for G0 family and we will continue. When it's done, we can see the screen similar to mine. In the central point, we can see um, selected microcontroller, all of its pins. Yellow pins are related to the power supply. Unused pins, free to use, are marked as gray, as you can see on the screen. The other colors means that the pin is already assigned as a power pin or some reference pin, as you can see on the screen. So the first thing we need to do to uh, create our LED toggling application is to select and configure the debug pins. So I would go to the system core. I would select from sys peripheral serial wire. Serial wire, it's in fact SWD, serial wire debug interface, which is common to all STM32, in general Cortex-M devices. So once we select this uh, interface, we can see that two pins, uh, PA13 and PA14, are already dedicated to this system peripheral SWDIO, SWCLK, so the debug interface pins. So this is the first point. The second point, we need to select the pin we would like to control. This package is not that big, so it's quite easy to detect PA5, it is over there. But if you will have bigger package, some PGA, where there are a lot of pins, a very nice way to detect the pin is to use the search field on the bottom of the screen. I can type here the pin I'm looking for, so PA, now you see all PA pins are highlighted. I'm selecting PA5, so it is over here. I'm clicking left uh, button on mouse and selecting GPIO output. Okay, now pin is uh, selected by me. This is why I can see this pin over it. And it is green, so it is selected. It, is, uh, it has some role assigned to it. Now I can assign as well the label to this pin to have easier access from my code. To this purpose, I'm clicking right button on mouse over the pin. And so I'm selecting enter user label. I would propose here LED underscore green and press enter. Okay, we've got debug pins, so we've got our LED, green LED pin. We do not need anything else uh, for the moment from this uh, from this perspective. Let's have a look on the clock configuration. So this is the second tab. Clock configuration is uh, over here. I just click it and I can see the clock scheme uh, of selected stm 32 g 71 microcontroller. By default, all stm 32 devices are clocked by the internal oscillators. In this case, it is HSI, so high speed internal RC. Its frequency is 16 megahertz. So this is the default clock source for the system, as you can see. Uh, we are not using any PLL uh, and external components. This is just to simplify the application and make it easy to start. We will not change anything on this step. We will play with the clock configuration during our next hands-ons. Okay, let's go to the project manager to generate the code. As you can see uh, from the project manager, we've got already specified the project name, project location. We've got uh, as well the toolchain folder location and toolchain IDE. As you can see, there is no selection over here in the toolchain IDE as we are running uh, STM32 Cube, Cube IDE, which is the combination of existing STM32 Cube MX and C++ um, environment. There is no option to change the toolchain. To generate the code, it is enough just to save the current project. As you can see here on the top, uh, we've got a small star, which means that the file has been edited and it's, it must be saved. So I just press Ctrl S and uh, I've got an information window whether I would like to generate the code. I just press yes and the code is generated. Uh, you can see it on the left side of the screen. So here on the left side, you can see the project explorer for our project G0 underscore lab. You can see some main components here. 
like a driver's source startup include uh, then IOC file, which is the device configuration file we just finished, and the linker file for the flash memory. Now we will open the main.c file, which is the main source file for our application. What we can see here is a template generated by our configuration tool. Within this, uh, we can see the main uh, function. We can see some set of uh, configuration functions which are using the HAL library. So the next step we need to do uh, is to perform this LED toggling. And to control this uh, LED, we will go to the while one loop uh, over here. Please remember to uh, keep your code within this user code, uh, begin user code and uh, spaces. Otherwise, uh, if you put it somewhere else, like in this line, which are just between those areas, your code would be erased during regeneration of the code or any modification done within the device configuration. Okay, so let's uh, start with the coding. So the first thing we need to do is uh, to find some function which would control our LED. As you remember, we are using the HAL libraries. HAL, let me remind you, it's hardware abstraction layer. And all of the functions which are within HAL libraries begin with the prefix HAL. So HAL underscore. Then, if you would like to control some peripheral, we need to, to put its name. To control LED, we need to control GPIO, where we've got the LED connected. So the next point would be GPIO underscore. And if we don't know which function could be used here, we can use control space. Control space is looking within the library and it's displaying all the functions which are starting with HAL underscore GPIO underscore. It is very nice feature implemented in, in Eclipse environment. It's speeding up the, the, the coding process. So from the list of the available functions, I would select this uh, HAL GPIO toggle pin. And we've got two arguments here. One is the port and the second one is the pin. I can use here the name of the port, so GPIO A and then GPIO pin 5. But please remember that we have used label for the pin. It is LED underscore green. And if we use label, it should be visible as well for the coding. So let's use this label. LED underscore green, control space. And I can see two defines. The first one is port, the second one is pin. I would select the port and on the second position I will do the same. LED, control space, LED green pin. The first thing is done, LED toggling. The result of the function would be toggling of a PI5 pin where our green LED is connected. To make it visible, we need to put some delay after. How to find the delay? Within the HAL libraries, we've got the, as well the dedicated function to make a delay. Uh, let's try to find it. HAL underscore delay. As an argument, we need to put a delay value in milliseconds. I would put uh, 500, so it will be half a second. And, uh, and that's it. The count is done. Now we need to build it. To build the code uh, for this project, we'll use the hammer button. It will take some time. We can see uh, information about uh, the output data. Uh, so how big uh, is the code, uh, how much data we've got, uh, what, is, what is the output file name, what was the time used for the compilation. Our next step would be to run the debug session. Okay, let's connect our boards of micro USB cable, you should see this uh, red LED on the right side of the of the top connector turned on. It means that uh, the driver is properly installed and uh, our board is properly detected by the system. Once the board is connected, let's try to run the debug session. For this purpose, we've got this bug icon over here. Just press it. Now we've got a selection how way we would like to debug this application. Uh, we will select the second option, so STM32 MCU CC++ application. Okay. 
Now there's a spice to edit the debug configuration. We will not do uh, any modifications here. So let's just press OK. And now we can see again the warning about the perspective switch. Uh, you remember it uh, for the first time when we started this project, there was a warning about the device uh, configuration perspective. Now we will switch again from uh, CC++ perspective for editing the code into the debug perspective. I would press switch with remember my decision, just not to waste time to click this window all the time. I will go to the debug session. The difference we can see right now is that we can see a bit different uh, top bar which has some buttons which allows us to perform debug the application. So start the code execution so we can see the uh, resume, uh, the code execution, we can see the suspend code execution, we can see terminate of the debug, uh, debug session. Uh, we can as well disconnect from the target. There are some uh, components as well uh, to go within the code. Let's just press resume to start our application. As a result, uh, you should see green LED toggling, half second on, half second off. To stop, to disconnect from the target, you should press the terminate button. And now as a result, you will come back to CC++ perspective to continue the code processing. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part, I will demonstrate how to create a, a project using STM32 Cube IDE and HAL libraries for G0 family to use external interrupts to control our LED on board. The objective of this session is to properly configure IO line to work as an external interrupt source and use it to control our LED. In this part I would demonstrate as well how to configure the interrupt controller built in within Cortex-M devices. It is so-called NVIC, Nested Vectored Interrupt Controller. This is the block diagram of uh, external interrupt module which is built in with an stm 32 g 0 microcontrollers. As you can see on the left, this block is connecting all of I.O. pins. We can have up to five I.O. ports with an stm 32 g 0 lines. We can have as well some other sources, wake-up sources, events, which can act as an external interrupts. We will focus on usage of external lines, coming from GPIO port C, because our blue button, which we will use as an external interrupt, is connected to PC13 pin. If you are interested in more details concerning external interrupt module, Cortex-M core details, you can refer to our online training dedicated to STM32 G0 family. We will use uh, in our exercise as well uh, the green LED, uh, which is connected to port PA5. And our blue button, which is connected to PC13. As you can see, we should detect the following edge of uh, external interrupt. Let's start stm 32 cube ID project. I would use the same workspace like uh, previously generated G0 underscore LED to toggle LEDs. The first thing I would like to do is to close the current project. This is a very nice feature of uh, an Eclipse, because uh, if I close it, uh, all of the files related to this uh, project will be closed as well. So I just click on the right button on mouse and select Close Project. So now the project is still present in the workspace, but uh, I would be sure that uh, I would operate on the proper one. And all of the files related to these projects are closed as well. Uh, to open it, I just double click on the name and the project is open again. 
Okay, so let's close it and let's create a new one related to our external interrupts. To do this, uh, I, will, I can go either to file new uh, STM32 project or I can use this icon over here. So new and STM32 project. It is uh, starting with uh, initialization of the uh, micro selection. So we can select the microcontroller we would like to use. In our case, it would be G071RB. And we'll use this LQFP64 package version. I press next. Now I need to specify the, the name of, uh, of the project. In our case, it will be G0XT. I press finish. Now the application will start the device configuration perspective. Okay, we can see our microcontroller. I can scroll wheel on the mouse to zoom it in. The first thing is connection of the debug interface. So I would go to system core, sys, serial wire, then PA13 and 14 would be dedicated for the debug interface, SWD. The second point is a configuration of our green LED pin, PA5. Left button on mouse and I select GPIO output and I would like to set the label on it. I click right button on mouse and I select enter user label. And I would select LED underscore green enter. And we need to uh, configure properly the pin which is used by our blue button. It is PC13. I'm looking for this pin using this uh, search uh, window. PC13, it's over on the left side. Again, I click left button on mouse. I select the last option, GPIO XT13. You see that. Um, we see some warning within the sys peripheral, uh, which means that uh, system wake up 2 will be not accessible anymore because we selected this pin uh, PC13 as uh, GPIO XT13. If I would click once again on the left mouse button, we see here several functions which can be selected for this pin. One of those is system wake up 2 like it's visible on the left side of the screen. This is why uh, this is highlighted right now on red, which means that this function would be not available anymore. Okay, let's come back to our pin. So we've got GPIO XT13. Let's uh, add a label as well to this pin. So over the pin, I click right button on mouse. I select enter user label. I would select the name blue button, enter. You can refer to those uh, settings within main.h file. All the labels are stored there. Concerning the pins, this is all we would like to do. We will do not perform any clock configuration modification. What we need to do as well is to properly configure this uh, external interrupt input pin to be active on falling edge. How to do this? We will go to the system core GPIO configuration. If I select PC13, I can see some additional configurations. Uh, GPIO mode, this is something which is important for us. Uh, I can see here external interrupt mode with rising edge trigger detection. This is the default setting. We will change it by scrolling down to interrupt mode with falling edge detection. We will not select any pull up or pull down, which is uh, available on the pin, and we will not change the blue button. The last point, which is necessary to be done to have active interrupt external line, is to uh, enable um, the interrupt signal within uh, interrupt controller. How to do this? We can go either within GPIO uh, to the NVIC tab and just select enable. Or we can go directly to NVIC settings and enable this signal uh, on this side. Once it is done, 
This is the time to generate the code. The easiest way to do this is just to save the current project. So Control S. We see some action is going. Right now the application is generating the code based on the selections uh, on the configuration of the device of the peripherals we have just done within this perspective. Okay, the code is generated. We can go to the source files. So let's go to the main.c and we can see here a lot of uh, lines, a lot of comments and uh, sections like user code, begin user code, end. This is the place where our code should be located in order to keep it in project regenerations. So what we need to do, so the first thing is to define the flag, the variable, uh, which would be changed within the interrupt routine. And based on this, uh, on this value, we will toggle LED or not. Okay, so let's scroll up. And we've got a section private variables. It's more or less line 47. And we will define uh, the 8-bit value, which could be called flag with initial value set to zero. Next point would be to implement the LED toggling in case the flag is set. And set of the flag would be done within the interrupt routine. I would start with the if loop. If one flag and now we need to toggle LED. So we are using HAL libraries. This is why this prefix HAL. Then GPIO and control space to select the function. I would select toggle pin. The first argument here is a port name. Uh, as I'm using labels, I will start with the label name, LED green, that's the port, and the same for the pin number. I would select my uh, labels, control space, and the pin. So within this function, I will toggle LED uh, if the flag is set. Then we need to clear this flag afterwards. So the missing point is to create the procedure where we will set the flag. And the location of this procedure should be related somehow to our interrupt. How to do this? Let's go to the interrupt routines file, which is stm32g0xx-it.c. Let's scroll down. This is the file which contains all implemented uh, interrupt routines. So at the, uh, the beginning, you can see some system functions like fault handlers, uh, cystic handler, which is used uh, to generate the timeouts. And below, more or less line 145, you can see as well uh, the external uh, interrupt handler, which is called XT4215. Uh, in this, uh, in Cortex M0 uh, Plus, which is the base core for this microcontroller, some external interrupts are grouped together. And our 13, number 13, is within the common vector used uh, from channels from 4 to 15. If you are interested in more details about the, the, the structure of this external interrupt peripheral, please refer to the separate uh, online training, uh, which is available on our webpage. Now we will focus on uh, handling the interrupt. So within the HAL library, uh, the, once you generate the code, using external interrupts or any other interrupts, uh, this kind of the interrupt procedure would be generated automatically. And there would be only one function, which is located within the HAL uh, library. I would go to its location. It is located in a GPIO peripheral uh, source file. And uh, the role of this function is to select the, mm, the source of the interrupt, clear the flag, and at the end call the proper callback. In our case, we will use the following edge interrupt, so we will call this callback. We should call this callback. Those callbacks are implemented uh, within the library as an empty functions with weak attribute, which means that we can implement them as well in our code. And uh, during the compilation, we should not receive any warning. This is the role of this weak 
uh, attribute here. Okay, so I will just copy the name of the callback and its arguments into my code. Very good location for this is uh, section user code begin for, which is below the main uh, function. So I would put this function over here. So as you have seen, uh, the flags uh, concerning to the external interrupt are cleared by the by the HAL library. So the only thing is to implement some action which is necessary for us. And uh, as you remember, what we need to do within the interrupt uh, procedure is to set the flag. So I set the flag, I save the code, and I'm trying to build it. I click the hammer icon. It takes some time. At the end, I can see the size of the of the code. Compilation time, and in case of any warnings or errors, those should be visible as well within this console window. Once it's done, let's start a debug session. For this, I'm clicking this bug. I need to select the way I would like to debug the application. I would select STM32 MCO CC++ application. I would not change anything in the edit configuration. This is why I press OK. Those windows would be displayed on during the first run of the debug session for the project. In the meantime, I can see the switch from the CC++ perspective into the debug perspective. It is quite well visible because I can see the different toolbar. On the right side of the screen, I can see the window with uh, possible visibility of the variables, breakpoints, expressions, uh, and uh, the registers within the micro. We will use it in the in the next the next sections. Okay. Now we will just run the application. So I press the uh, the play button. And now if I press the blue button, on each blue button press, I can see the change of the green LED state. To exit this uh, debug session, I just need to press this terminate uh, button. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part, we will use timer to control our green LED in so-called PWM generation mode. The objective of this session is to configure the timer in a PWM mode to blink uh, the green LED to control it. Uh, so instead of using the software code, we will let timer to do the job and toggle the LED. This time we'll use PA5 as an alternate function and we will let timer to channel 1 to control it. Our system will work on an internal clock 16 MHz divided by 2 this time. Uh, so our system clock would be 8 MHz. We would like to keep the same timing like in our previous exercises when we controlled green LED by software. To do this we need a 1 Hz period with 50% duty cycle PWM signal. Let's start a new project with an stm to cube ID. I would use uh, already existing workspace with previous exercises. To start a new project I can go to File, New, stm 32 Project or direct it to this icon and select stm 32 Project as well. It is starting with the target selection. I'm selecting my microcontroller, so it is G071RB. I'm selecting the LQFP64 package, which is, which is present on the Nucleo board we are using during this hands-on. Selecting Next. The next step is a project name. I would call it G0PWM. And press Finish. Now it is initializing the device configuration window which is in fact the cube STM32 CubeMX application or plugin within Eclipse environment. It takes some time. As a result, we should see uh, our G0 PWM IOC file, which is the configuration file, the file for the configuration of the, of the microcontroller. I can zoom it out uh, for better visibility of the 
of the microcontroller. You can use either those plus minus uh, zoom buttons uh, over here or the wheel on the mouse. Okay, the first thing would be the selection of a debug interface. So I will go to the system core, sys, serial wire. I can see PA13 and 14 dedicated uh, for um, debug interfaces, WD. And the second thing is a configuration of uh, our PA5 pin, which will be controlled by timer 2, channel 1. We can do it uh, in two different ways. The first is uh, by the selection of the timers. So I would select timers, timer 2. From this I would select the clock source as an internal clock. I will not select anything from the slave mode nor trigger source because we will not use any timer cooperation, timer synchronization within this library. So only the clock source as an internal clock and I would use channel 1 as PWM generation channel 1. Uh, please be careful uh, and do not select this PWM generation output because it would generate PWM signal but it will be not connected to the pin but used internally. Okay, so we are selecting PWM generation channel 1 and it is automatically by default routed to PA0 pin which is not our choice. To change it, I press control button on my keyboard and uh, left button on mouse and by clicking the left button on mouse I can see the alternate locations of this of this function. I can see that one of those is PA5 so I keeping this control button and left button on mouse pressed and I'm just dragging dragging this PA0 pin roll to PA5 and releasing the left button on mouse and control button on the keyboard. Uh, as a result, I'm migrating my function, my timer, timer 2 channel 1 location from PA0 to PA5. So this is the, this is one of the way how we can do it. The second way is a bit, a bit different. Uh, so please let me uh, come back uh, to the, to the original setting. I'm pressing the left button on mouse and selecting Left button. I'm pressing left button on mouse, selecting reset state, and instead of selecting the role of the uh, on the timer, I'm going to PA5 directly and pressing left button on mouse, and I'm selecting timer two, channel one. I'm selecting timer two, channel one. Now. I can see the pin over this button. Its label is changed to timer2 underscore channel1 and the color of the, of the pin has changed from gray to yellow, which means that this pin is reserved, is booked by me and it needs to be configured. To do this, I'm going to uh, my timer2 configuration into the mode window and within channel1, I'm selecting the role of this, of this pin which should be PWM generation channel 1. After this operation, I can see that uh, the color of the pin has changed to green, which means that we've got this pin uh, configured properly. So, we've got uh, configuration of the pin. The next step would be the configuration of uh, the timer itself. Before this, uh, let's do the short exercise on the clock configuration. As you can see, the default settings of the clock configuration is the following. We are using internal clock source, a high-speed internal RC, which is 16 MHz, and then this clock is going directly to the system, clocking all other peripherals. What we will do within this very simple exercise, we will change this 16 MHz within this high-speed clock on the, on the bus to 8. I would just change this 16 value over here into 8 and press enter. As you can see, application automatically adopted its settings to my target value. All the system is now working on 8 MHz, including all the peripherals. OK, let's come back to our application. So I'm switching back to pinouts and configuration. And now we will focus more on the configuration of the selected timer. 
I will do some space over here. Mode is already selected, we will not change anything. So the clock source internal clock and uh, uh, channel 1, PWM generation channel 1. Okay, so the configuration. Within the timer configuration we've got uh, quite a lot of fields uh, which we can configure. In our case we need to configure the timer to work in the PWM mode with the frequency of 1 Hz and beauty cycle 50%. How to do this? We've got uh, the input clock for the timer on the level of 8 MHz, so we need to uh, divide it somehow. For this we've got a few possibilities. The most convenient ones are the prescaler. This is the first uh, component uh, we can use here. So we need to downgrade somehow this 8 MHz the, to smaller value. Uh, so the, I would uh, divide it first by 128. I put 127 because uh, in the register settings uh, there is one edit automatically to the value PSC with, which we've got in this field. This is why to have division 128 we need to put 127 in this field. Okay, so as a result to the timer we will have uh, instead of 8 megahertz we will have uh, 62,500 hertz uh, as on, on in its input. Uh, then the counter will be up counting, uh, and the second point uh, we should configure is a period, so the value to which the timer would calculate. And uh, how to do 1 Hz from 62.5 kHz? We need to divide this uh, 60 to 500 Hz by 60 uh, to 499. And again, uh, we are subtracting one from the value to be to be put due to the fact that we are calculating from zero. So in fact, as a result for this, um, we would create one hertz signal. So we've got one hertz. The only missing point uh, is to set the duty cycle. The duty cycle we are configuring within the pulse, and its value should be related to the period value. If you would like to have 50%, we need uh, to put half of it, so it will be uh, 31,250. In this case, uh, as a result of these uh, operations, uh, we would have on PA5 uh, pin, which uh, would reflect uh, timer to channel 1, uh, 1 hertz signal with 50% duty cycle. Now we are ready to generate the project, so I just press Ctrl S, Ctrl Save. Now we see that something is happening. Okay, let's go to the source. So I'm going to the sources, main.c. And again, I can see uh, a lot of user code begin, user code end sections, which are dedicated to my code to be protected against removal during the code regeneration. And what I need to do right now is to start the timer. Because my uh, generated application is only the configuration done by me. And I need to I need to start the timer. We need to start the timer only once before while one loop uh, has been called. So I'm using to this purpose user code begin to section. So I would start with HAL team because it's a for the timer, and I need to select the proper functions. As you can see, there are quite a lot of them, so I would just limit them by underscore. And uh, let's select something which would generate some PWM for us. Okay, here there are some names, and uh, we can see three. The first one is start just starting PWM signal without uh, an, an interrupt or DMA configuration. Then there is as well start DM, start PWM start DMA or IT, which are using DMA or interrupt generation on its functionality. We do not use it. We will select uh, PWM start function. The first argument uh, is a handler to the timer we are using. Here you can see there is as well uh, the information that we can select this timer to from our settings. And then the second one is a channel. We will select team underscore channel. 
and we can see we can select the proper channel. Channel one is the is our choice. Okay. Control save to save the file. And now let's try to build it. So I press the hammer. Okay, and now we can start the debug session. So I press this bug icon. I select STM32 MCU C application. Press OK. I will not change anything in the configuration. I press OK. And now our application will be switched to the debug perspective. If you press resume button, we can see our green LED toggling like before, but this time it is controlled directly by the timer. To exit from debug mode, we click terminate. Thank you for watching this video. STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section, we will focus on the library's repository management. I would like to demonstrate to you how to configure properly and manage libraries which you are using during work with STM32 Cube IDE. Let's start STM32 Cube IDE. I would select one of already existing workspaces, which would contain at least one active project. Now on the screen we can see uh, the workspace with three projects. One of those is active. This is G0 underscore PWM. So let's start first uh, with the configuration of repository location and the uh, internet connection. So to do this, uh, let's go to window, preferences, STM32 cube. And from this uh, set of uh, settings, uh, let's select firmware update. Within firmware updater, we can select the firmware installation repository. So this is the location of all cool cube libraries which you are using during your development. By default, uh, after the installation of this STM32 cube IDE, there is a quite long path selected, so I would suggest to, to, to select it according to your needs, to your preferences later on. Within this window you can select as well the connection mode. Offline mode means that uh, your application will not connect uh, to the internet all the time, so it can work offline. Then uh, checked automatic settings, I would suggest to select the manual check, just to avoid any, any delay during the startup of the application, and uh, select no auto refresh at application start just to save some time during startup of co complete application. You can check as well whether uh, there is a proper connection of your uh, application to the servers to grab data. So we just can just press check connection. And if everything is okay, you should see this uh, okay icon on the button. In case uh, there is an uh, X button, uh, X mark, it means that there is something wrong uh, with the connection. Please have a look into this network connections and configure properly uh, your proxy entries, if any. Proxy settings uh, you can collect from your IT department. One important point within this uh, firmware updater settings is that you can perform the firmware installation repository configuration only in the case if there is no active device configuration project. In fact, device configuration file. So for example, if I would open the IOC file for this project, and I will go to window preferences, you see, Firmware installation repository is inaccessible right now and there is a warning that we should close IOC editor. Okay, so I close it. I come back to this again and now I can edit. Now let's have a look on the repository uh, management. How we can add, how we can remove libraries, how we can update them. To do this, uh, we need to go to help and select Manage Embedded Software Packages. 
As you can see, at the moment it is inaccessible for us, which means that we need to open any of the IOC files to make our device configuration or stm 32 cubemix uh, application running. Okay, so now we see some IOC file opened. Now if we go to help, we can see manage embedded software packages active. Okay, I select this option. And now uh, I can see the new window, which contains uh, two tabs, stm 32 cube MCU packages, which is related to the cube libraries for all stm 32 devices. And there's another tab, STMicroelectronics, which contains some additional packages related to additional components coming from ST, like uh, BLE uh, sensors, uh, MEMS sensors, NFC uh, components. Uh, so those are the software packages which allows uh, communication, which allows cooperation between STM32 devices and uh, some additional uh, components. We will focus on STM32 Cube MCU packages and let's go to the G0 section. I will just unscrew it. I can see at the moment, uh, if I sc will scroll down, I can see that within STM32 G0 there are three libraries available version 1.00, then 1.1.0 and 1.2.0. The most up-to-date one is 1.2.0 and uh, this one is already installed in my repository. This is visible by this uh, green uh, s uh, square over here. Uh, I can download uh, uh, another one. I just press uh, within the another square. Uh, this uh, marking means that this library has been selected and can be installed now. To install this library, I, c I need to go below and press this Install Now button. To remove the library, I need to mark it first. It will uh, have this red X on it. And then I need to press Remove Now. OK. Uh, sometimes uh, it is not possible to perform the installation of the library online. Uh, this is why it is possible as well to install the libraries offline using uh, already downloaded zip files. All of the libraries are stored uh, on ST servers as a zip files. Those can be downloaded separately uh, from the web. And then once you've got such a zip file, you can install it from this uh, from this point using this from local option in this case you are just selecting the location of this zip file press open and it will be installed uh, automatically we can check as well the available updates on existing libraries um, on the tool itself to do this we need to go to help check for updates in my case there is one update available i can check by using this refresh, whether there is something new coming. There is no other update, so I can decide to install it, just selecting this and press Install Now, or ignore it. I would select the second option, I will not use this uh, library for a while. This help check for updates is important. If you select that within your repository configuration, manual check for updates, because it allows you to check whether there is something new, something more updated uh, within the tools uh, you're using in the time which is most uh, suitable for you. Thank you for watching this video. Welcome on our stm 32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part, uh, we'll try to convert our existing example from HAL to low layer. We will reuse our existing external interrupt hands-on session, which has been fully done using HAL libraries, hardware abstraction layer libraries, and we will change it to low layer. So in this project, we have configured already two GPIOs, one is output to control LED, the second one is an external interrupt which is connected to our blue button on the board. 
we configured as well the nested vector interrupt controller NVIC uh, to accept interrupts from the external pin. But now we will reuse this configuration and transfer everything to low layer uh, to check what is what is the difference between those two approaches. Okay, I have just opened STM32Cube IDE. I'm opening the project for external interrupts. And I'm opening G0 external interrupt IOC file by just double clicking to open the device configuration tool. The project is done, it's ready. We do not need to change anything within the pinout, within the clock configuration. So again, we've got the PC13 is uh, configured as GPIO underscore external interrupt, uh, line 13, and its label is blue underscore button. And then PA5 is configured as GPIO underscore output, and its label is LED underscore green. Additionally, we have selected SWD interface as a debug one, and we have not changed anything in a clock configuration. So we are working on an internal oscillator, HSI, 16 MHz, which is clocking the complete system. The only difference, which we'll do right now, is the difference within the project manager. We go to the, from project to the advanced settings, and for each of those two modules, RCC and GPIO, we will switch from hull to low layer. I just click on this hull and select low layer instead. The same for GPIO. Once done it, I will generate the code. So I just press Ctrl S, Ctrl Save. And now I need to regenerate the project. So I click this gear icon to generate the new project using low layer libraries. I can see some action on the left side. Now if I will go into the HAL uh, driver, within includes I can see instead of HAL, uh, dri HAL files, I can see low layer ones. So the structure of the name for the file is the following, name of the family, underscore, type of the library, in our case low layer, underscore, name of the peripheral. Most of the functions, in fact macros, to control the peripherals are stored in the header files as a macros, as a macros which are operating on particular registers. The idea behind uh, the low layer macros and functions is that uh, each function, each macro, is operating on single register. Okay, let's uh, have a look uh, on our source file, main.c. Okay, we can see still this user code, begin user code, and uh, sections. We can see still our flag, which was uh, between the user code section, so it was not deleted. Additionally, we can see some new functions, like uh, enabling the clock to system config and power. And uh, we still can see um, our HAL function to toggle the LED because it was within the user code area. If I would try now to compile the code using the hammer, I can see two errors. If I would inspect it, I can see that uh, HAL functions is not recognizable because we switched the library from HAL to low layer. I would comment it out. And then I will try to find a similar function with a low layer library. So I'm starting low layer underscore GPIO underscore control space and sorry underscore control space and then um, oh there is exactly the same function, same name, toggle pin. And again we need to specify the port and the pin mask. For this, I would reuse the arguments from above. Now it should be should be okay. Let me spend a while on the uh, definitions of those of those macros. Uh, we can find them within main.h file. 
as you can see, LED green pin uh, has been transferred to LL underscore GPIO pin 5 and port is the same. If you would change to HAL again, those definitions would be changed as well. Uh, instead, this LL underscore GPIO pin 13, we will have only GPIO pin 13 and GPIO pin 5. So the application during the code generation is uh, handling on all of the definitions uh, which has been uh, developed by us during the device configuration. Okay, so we have the main uh, while one loop ready. Next point would be implementation of the interrupt procedure. In the HAL version, we were using this uh, callback, which would be not used anymore. So I would comment it out because uh, the, the structure of the interrupts uh, handling is pretty different here. So let's go to interrupt uh, vector uh, file when we've got all the procedures of active interrupts. And again, we've got some system ones like NMI, Hardfold, SVC, PentSV, and Cystic. And uh, we've got our IRQ handler for external interrupts. So as you can see, again, uh, everything is done for us. I mean, detection of uh, source of the interrupt and clearing the flag. But instead of calling additional function, everything is done. Uh, everything is done within this uh, uh, this file. So we've got one call uh, less in the in the hier hierarchy of the interrupt handling process. So the only thing we need to do is to set our flag. Flag set to one, but we need to import it from our main file. This is why I will go here above this file and I would just import it extern. Okay. Now let's try to build it again. No errors, no warnings. And let's start the debug session. I press the play or resume button and uh, I'm pressing now the blue button and each blue button is changing the state of our green LED. So the application is working uh, properly. I terminate the code execution and now application is still in flash so I can still play with the, with the port. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this part I would like to demonstrate to you some basic components concerning project management within the workspace, how the projects are organized, how to switch between them, how to switch to different workspace, what are the key features and which can help uh, you on day-by-day -day development. So the objectives. Uh, we will demonstrate how to manage the projects within stm 32 cube IDE. Uh, we will explore some project settings, basic ones, where to find the ma main, most important ones. I would like to demonstrate to you how to share the project with uh, others uh, using import-export features, how to switch to another, another uh, workspace and uh, how to restore some default settings by resetting the perspective. So let's start uh, from the beginning. Projects within stm 32 id as it is an Eclipse-based uh, environment, we are working on a workspace which can contain one or more uh, pr projects. Within the workspace we can perform some basic operation on the projects. We can switch, with, switch between them, we can make them active uh, or disactive, we can close project, we can delete the project, we can delete the project as well from the file system. So all of those features are uh, available. Let's start uh, with uh, the basic uh, concept, uh, project opening, project closing. As I told you before, uh, only one project can be active at the moment, but uh, many of the projects can be opened. 
there is a big risk that uh, if you have opened uh, more than one project and uh, from each project you've got opened some files, it can be difficult uh, to um, to manage it. Uh, it can it may happen that uh, you will edit some files uh, from the project which is not uh, currently active. It can create some mess. This is why there is a good feature within uh, Eclipse, and it is available as well within STM32 Cube IDE, uh, which is um, closing and opening the projects. The feature to, to, uh, which allows you to close and open the project. On the left part of the screen, you can see the example of the workspace, which contains uh, seven projects. Uh, one of those is open. This G0 LED uh, is open. Uh, to close this project, it is enough uh, to click on its name, then um, click the uh, right uh, button on mouse and select Close Project. In this case, uh, you will see the situation like on the, in the middle of the screen, that all projects are closed. Uh, to open the project, it's enough to double-click the, on the name of the project and then it becomes an o open and uh, in the same time active. What is good is that once you click, uh, when you close the project, all open uh, opened files which are related to this project are closed automatically. Here you can see it on the screen that we've got the main.c and the IOC file related uh, to G0 LED opened. Once you select the close of this of this project, those files are closed as well. Here is a more difficult example uh, when we've got uh, three main.c files opened in the same time from different projects and we've got uh, seven open projects at the same at the same time of course only one is active but sometimes it's quite difficult to change to check which one or which main.c file uh, is uh, for which uh, project uh, just to to make uh, to make an order of it uh, we are selecting one project just clicking on its name then we are pressing the right button on mouse and we are selecting close unrelated projects all other are projects which are not uh, uh, this g0 underscore led are closed automatically together with all files related to those projects only one main.c remains related to this g0 underscore led and uh, we can continue uh, the development to switch between, between the project is quite easy with an Eclipse and uh, stm 30 Cube IDE. It is just enough to click uh, with the left button on mouse uh, on the project we would like to make active and uh, there will be automatic switch from one project to uh, the other. How to check the properties of the, of the project? Uh, it is enough to highlight its name. So we click on its name, then we click on the right uh, button on mouse and select from the bottom of the of the menu properties. In this case, a new window would pop up with title properties for and name of the project. In our case, G0 underscore LED. And uh, within this window, we've got uh, all the settings available. Uh, for the project. Within CC++ build uh, we can select for example uh, configure the enable the parallel build of the application uh, so in case you've got a, a stronger PC a stronger uh, multi-core CPU you can you can select uh, the enable parallel build and uh, for example use optimal jobs which are optimal for your uh, for your application uh, then uh, within uh, C++ build settings, uh, you've got all uh, important settings concerning the tools which we are using to uh, generate uh, generate the code. So, uh, starting from the MCU settings, um, you can select the floating point unit which is used, instruction set which is used, runtime library, um, which is very important. Because, because it allows you to reduce the code which would be used by the, your application if you are not using all the features uh, from the, uh, the, the, the standard libraries. You can select, for example, Nano Library, which is uh, much smaller and uh, will not uh, increase the code of your project uh, drastically. 
So this is the uh, MCU uh, settings. Then uh, from the next option, MCU post build outputs, you can uh, select what kind of output files you would like to have uh, as a result of the build uh, of the of the project, so we can uh, generate binaries, uh, hexadecimal uh, hex, hex files, or uh, Motorola um, as uh, Motorola as files. So those are the options. So you can as well uh, display information about the size of generated code, and uh, you can select or unselect the uh, generation of the list file. Within tool settings, you can configure as well assembler, C compiler and uh, linker which is used to build your application. So this is the place when you can specify the optimization level, you can specify uh, some additional definitions which are used uh, within the preprocessor, you can specify some additional include paths um, or some other components which are uh, used by the compiler or linker or assembler. If you would like to share the project with others or uh, just uh, store the project uh, in some external repository, we can do it using export uh, option, which is uh, uh, as well the, the feature of the Eclipse environment. To do this, uh, we will need to go within the workspace to File Export. As a result, uh, we will see an export window. From this, uh, we need to select uh, from General uh, section either archive file, if you would like to store our project in a compressed form, zip or tar, uh, or file system, if you would like to store the project uh, in some folder. I will demonstrate the, the feature with archive file of zip, so general archive file. Then uh, window will change and it will display or available, I mean opened, uh, projects with an active uh, workspace. In our case uh, we've got uh, seven of them. Uh, we can select which projects we would like to export into the file and then we need to specify the ERHA file. This is this window below. We need to press browse and select the ERHA name. Uh, then we need to specify what would be the format. It can be zip, it can be tar. Uh, I would use zip uh, a zip file, and then once you do all those operation operations, you need to press finish. Having this zip file, you can share it within uh, other mem team members uh, from your from your team, and it would be possible to import it import it uh, from different uh, uh, workspace. To import the file uh, in within the workspace, you need to. Uh, to go to File Import option and from General you can select uh, what would you would you like to import. Uh, within STM32Cube IDE you have an option to import an archive file, existing projects into workspace, so the Cube IDE uh, projects, uh, file system, import uh, AC6 system workbench for STM32 projects or Atolic True Studio project. In our case, we will try to import the same file we have just exported. Uh, so we'll select general existing project into workspace. Uh, then we need to select either root directory if the project is stored as a file folder and not, uh, not a zip, or uh, if it's uh, select if it's uh, stored in an archive file, we need to select this select archive file and browse it. I can select interesting projects for me and then press the finish button. As a result, all of the projects are popping up in my active uh, workspace. Another, another thing uh, which is quite convenient within uh, stm 32 cube ID, it's coming from Eclipse, it's uh, switching the workspaces. Uh, we can imagine the situation that we are working on several projects or several workspaces and uh, to switch between them uh, it's quite easy. It's uh, just enough to go to File and Switch Workspace and um, as a result you can see the list of recently used workspaces and the option Other, which allows you to uh, select a different location of the workspace, which is already existing. Another important point, uh, once you're working with uh, 
STM32 CubeID um, is a perspective management. The perspective uh, is a set of windows uh, which are used uh, in the current uh, step of the of the development. Um, we can have uh, three main perspectives uh, within STM32 CubeID. The uh, first one is uh, device device configuration, which is very similar. In fact, it's based on STM32 CubeMX uh, device configurator. The second one is a CC++ perspective, which is used to code development, its compilation, its build. Uh, and uh, the third one is a debug configuration, which is used for the uh, debug purposes. It might happen that uh, once you are working on a the configuration on the we are working on a perspective you close uh, too many you close too many too many windows uh, change uh, the, the, the configuration in such a way that um, not everything is visible uh, it is easy to restore the default perspective view uh, from from the from the application by using window perspective reset perspective option uh, which would uh, restore the perspective view to its default uh, configuration. In this part, I would like to demonstrate projects management within stm 32 cube IDE. So the first thing uh, I would like to demonstrate how we can manage projects within stm 32 cube IDE workspace. Then we will explore, explore a bit uh, project settings and I will demonstrate how to uh, share the projects with others using import-export features and um, some additional points, uh, some additional features which can be uh, useful during your um, project development. Let's uh, switch to the workspace. I would use uh, for this demonstration purposes one of the existing uh, workspace. Uh, it contains all of the hands-ons uh, which uh, are prepared for this uh, cube ID uh, basic sessions. You can find them in the training materials in the zip file as well. So we can you can uh, duplicate. Uh, here on the workspace you can see several projects. Uh, all of them are closed at the moment. Uh, to open the project it is just enough to double click on it. I just double click on this G0 underscore XTI. This project uh, became opened and active. Active means that if I would uh, uh, press on it, I would press on the hammer, uh, only this project would be built. Important point is that active uh, open project uh, can be exported later on. All closed project closed projects are not handled uh, within export operation, which we'll discuss a bit later on. To close the project, we need to click the right button on mouse and select close project. Important point is that when you close the project, you are closing all the files related to this project. I will demonstrate now this feature, just opening a few files few projects I opened three main.c files from different projects uh, it is creating uh, it could create some problems during our development what we can do uh, here we can use this close project feature Let's assume the situation that we would like to continue development on G0 underscore PWM project. What I can do, I can just click right uh, on right button on mouse and select close unrelated projects. Please have a look uh, what it will be done. All the, pro all the other projects has been closed and all the files related to those projects are closed uh, as well. Only main.c file from G0 underscore PWM file is opened and can be edited. To delete the project, uh, we just need to delete, uh, click on the on the project and press delete. It will be deleted from the workspace. But to delete the project, we just need to either click on right button on mouse and select delete, or just select the, the project and press delete button. Um, if we just click OK, 
the project would be deleted from the workspace without uh, and it will be not deleted from the file system we can as well uh, select this delete project content on disk and then the project would be deleted physically from the disk we'll skip this process um, and now we will focus for a while on the project properties if we select the active project in our case it will be g0pwm i press the right button on mouse and select the last option last uh, position from the menu it is properties a new window will be displayed on the screen its title is properties for and name of the project in our case g0 underscore pwm within this uh, window we can perform some uh, configuration of the of the project uh, starting from uh, selection how the build process should be done if we are using multi-core uh, um, pc we can select enable parallel build and uh, select the number of the jobs which can be done build process in parallel so in, the, in my case it will be four uh, jobs in parallel done during the build process so this is the the, the, the first point then within the settings uh, next option i would like to discuss is uh, settings within the cc++ build uh, here in a tool settings we've got complete set of the parameters used by the uh, assembler compiler linker but as well uh, you can find here some settings about the mcu or post build op uh, uh, options which can be useful for your development within the mcu settings you can select the floating point unit which is used in your application you can select the instruction set or runtime library the sliced option is very uh, important uh, point because you can select the reduced c uh, library or standard c library the difference is that uh, in the reduced c libraries uh, you have uh, reduced functionality reduced uh, number of the functions or simplified functions but um, the uh, size of the uh, standard library is much much smaller so the application uh, in the final build uh, will be uh, smaller so this is the first uh, important point the second option uh, mcu post build outputs allows you to select what kind of output files you will have after build of your application you can have a binary file intel hex file motorola s record file or verilog file so you can select it uh, you can select more than one uh, you can uh, select as well to display information about the size uh, of the build uh, project it is done by default and you can select on unselect generation of the list file then you have uh, three my big sections uh, concerning assembler c compiler and linker uh, within those sections you can set some additional settings for those components uh, most important ones are within the c compiler so for example you can select the optimization level which is by default none so zero um, you can uh, modify the include paths you can add something something new you can add some define symbols within the preprocessor you can specify the debug level from none to maximum uh, with the number of the information which would be generated during the debug uh, session available during the debug session and those are the main uh, settings which are available for the project of course there are much more than than this but uh, for the complete set you can you can uh, refer to the to the manual uh, for the for this for this tool next point i would like to discuss uh, in this in this section is um, about um, the comfort of work with this within this environment so what we can see right now on the screen is so-called C++ perspective it is slightly modified by myself so I already closed some windows I can close more um, and uh, it may happen that during your development you click too much uh, you closed too much windows and uh, you don't know how to come back to the default state for this uh, you can go to window perspective reset perspective yes and now as a as a result current perspective will come back to its default 
default settings. Another thing I would like to demonstrate to you is to how to export and import projects within the workspace. In our current workspace we've got two open projects, the rest are closed. So let's uh, select the export option, so I will go, I will go File Export. I can select either archive file or file system or preferences. File system uh, will store the project uh, within its uh, within the separate folder of the folder structure, which is present in the in the project. I would select the archive file, which allow me to store everything in one single file, uh, either zipped or uh, tar format. I press next. As you can see, only active, only open, uh, sorry, only open projects are uh, available to be exported. I can select which of those I would like to export to the archive file. It can be in zip format, it can be in tar format. I would select zip, I would put it on the desktop. And now if I would go to the desktop, I can see uh, one zip file with the those two projects. It is possible as well to export a particular project from the workspace. I just click on the project to make it active. Then I click the right button on mouse and select export. And again, I have file, next. By default, there is only one selection of the file which I clicked on and I can continue with uh, exporting it to the uh, to separate file, let's call it like this, and finish. Okay, let's try to make an opposite operation. So I would uh, switch to different workspace, to new one. So I would go to File, Switch Workspace, Other, and I would call it Cube IDE 5. It takes some time. The cube IDE is restarting. Okay, it's it's restarting within new workspace cube IDE five, which we can see here on top. Um, we'll close this information center, or I can click import project. As I exported all the projects within the zip file, I would use as an import source archive. I will go to desktop and I would select the first file, MOOC1. You remember there were, in fact, uh, two projects. I can click Finish. And I can see both projects on the screen. We can open previously exported projects a bit differently. Let me delete those two uh, projects from this workspace. So I will delete it one by one. Okay, and now uh, I would select from the file, open projects from the file system. Again, I will select archive, archive, and select MOOC1. Yes. And you see the effect is exactly the same. Thank you for watching this video. STM32 Cube IDE by ZX training session. In this part, we will focus on power consumption calculator. This is a part of STM32 Cube IDE application, which allows us to estimate the power consumption of our application. To demonstrate this uh, application, I would create a new project with an existing workspace. So I'll go to File, New, STM32 Project. So again, I'm going uh, through STM32 target selector. We can do, of course, uh, some estimation of uh, current consumption for existing project, but uh, in this case, I would like to demonstrate something, uh, some particular settings. Okay, so we select uh, exactly the same microcontroller, G071RB. Yes, and uh, 
RQFP version. I just press next. Uh, I would name it uh, G0 PCC. All the settings are the same, default ones. Yes, Cubemix or device configuration perspective could be opened. Okay, so we've got empty project. Again, I would uh, select serial wire as a debug interface. Um, in our application, I would select as well RTC. Activate clock source uh, with wake up. Activate calendar with a wake up capability. I would like to demonstrate to you this power consumption calculator in connection with low power modes. So let's assume that we will use RTC uh, with internal wake up. We will use as well PC13 in the configuration of um, system wake up 2 as well. And uh, additionally, we will select ADC1 with some channels measurements. So let's select two channels and uh, from communication peripherals let's select uh, low power tur one in asynchronous mode 9600 bits per second 7 let's do 8 bits including parity without parity one stop bit the rest remains the same for the clock configuration, I would keep the default settings. I would not focus on much on the on the configuration. And uh, I switching to power consumption calculator for this particular application. My idea is to demonstrate to you the some typical application, low power application, uh, which should perform some analog measurements from time to time, receive uh, transmit some data over the UART and uh, wake up periodically using uh, RTC auto wake up functionality or a dedicated pin uh, connected to PC13. Before we go further, let's uh, save our application. Control S. Yes, it will generate a code. And now let's switch to tools and power consumption uh, calculator. We can start with a VDD selection. Uh, it can be 1.8 uh, to 0 0.4303.6 uh, volts. Uh, let's select the uh, 3 volts. Temperature cannot cannot be changed. And now we can select the battery which we will use uh, to work with this uh, with our application. So when I press select, a new window pop up. When I can either add my own battery, which can be specified by me. Or I can select uh, already existing and defined batteries. I would select uh, classical AA1. It's 1.5 volts. This is why I need two of those. I could put here two in series. I can increase as well uh, the capacity in milli. I can put some of those in parallel as well. This application allows me to estimate how much time I can work with my application using specified set of batteries. Next point is the definition of the steps, so how the application will work. To do this, uh, I select a new step. As a result, this kind of window is popping up. I select um, the power mode. So either run or any of low power modes. So usually at the beginning we are in a run mode to configure the, all the peripherals. And now I can enable all the peripherals which has been enabled by me uh, within the pinout and configuration phase. I would select this. So as you can see, uh, we've got uh, ADC, GPIO-A, GPIO-C, uh, low power UART and RTC. Having this, uh, uh, we can continue. So power range. 
Uh, with an STM32 G0, we've got two power ranges, medium and high. More information about uh, the power range available in the G0 family you can find on dedicated online training. I would select the range to medium, which allows me to limit the current consumption. So as we enabled all the peripherals which has been selected by us in the previous step, we can continue our evaluation. So power range will set to medium to lower the total current consumption of the system. Memory fetch type uh, we will use flash, standard one. Uh, the VDD is already programmed, the uh, voltage source is battery, CPU frequency we will use uh, 2 MHz to lower the, the power consumption. Uh, clock configuration we will use HSI because we are using internal clock and step duration so how long we will be in this run mode at the beginning, I would set on 10 milliseconds. Uh, we can specify as well some additional current consumption, which can be related to connected peripherals, connected uh, chips uh, to our microcontroller. Uh, so I would keep it uh, like this without any, any additional points. We've got the step, step consumption, more or less uh, 500 uh, microamps. I press add. And I can see on the screen right now the current consumption in time. So right now it is IDD by step, so this step only. We can see right now the current consumption within one step. If we will use only this step, uh, we can count on our battery for 7 months, 22 days and 1 hour. Okay, but... Uh, we discussed at the beginning that I would like to create a low power application. This is why I would add a new step. And within this new step, I would select the stop mode, stop one. Stop one uh, mode with active uh, RTC only. And uh, I would like to be in this state for one second without any additional current consumption. I'm adding this amount as well. And after this one second, uh, I would like to uh, be in run mode again. But before this, uh, I would like to show to you right now how our consumption profile has changed. Please have a look. Right now we've got all two steps, run and stop, and we've got the average current consumption curve which is on the level of 12 microamperes. Okay, so we create the next new step. So this time it would be wake up from stop. We cannot select run mode or sleep mode or other modes because we need to wake up, first wake up from a stop mode. Uh, so this is quite, auto quite automatic uh, mode. Uh, so I just edit and after wake up from stop I can add run mode again so new step I'm selecting run uh, memory flash from memory fetch from flash and again ADC well, I can enable all the peripherals from the pinout, but this time I would like to be in this mode only for one millisecond. Above 2 megahertz, clock configuration HSI, one millisecond, add. Okay, so we've got uh, four steps. Um, we can save the sequence, we can load other sequence, we can compare the sequence with the other ones, we can display the sequence as well. We can have a look uh, how much time uh, we can work on the batteries we selected. So if we keep this scenario like this, uh, we can work with these batteries uh, 13 years, 2 months, 23 days and 7 hours. Average current consumption is uh, 12.7 microamps. We can select uh, the different uh, display of this uh, profile. So for example, we can can so select uh, IP con consumption, so in split on ADCs and uh, GPIO, UART, so all the peripherals we are using in microarms. 
Uh, there is a split on digital and analog part, which is important in uh, components uh, like ADC or uh, reference voltage uh, used by the ADC. Um, we can select only analog, we can select only digital uh, peripherals, uh, we've got uh, split between run and low power modes. So there are various number of um, display of the, of the information. Then we can save it, we can print it uh, for further use. Uh, what is good in this application is that this power consumption calculator allows you to estimate to estimate the current consumption uh, of the application, how it is working, and uh, the, all the data which are used within this application are taken from the data sheet. So in the real application uh, you can be sure that uh, your data, your realistic data, would be very, very similar. So this is very good help if you would like to start with the new development and just check whether the select microcontroller is appropriate or not uh, to your uh, application. Thank you for watching this video. Hello and welcome on our STM32 Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section we will create a DC example using DMA transfers of the conversion results. A DC will be triggered by the timer events. For all of those uh, actions we will use HAL library. We will start with uh, launching STM32 Cube IDE. We can use uh, existing uh, workspace or we can create a new one and we will create a new project for STM32G071 microcontroller. I will create a new project uh, with an existing workspace. So I go to File, New, STM32 Project. To start with the target selection. So our, our microcontroller is uh, STM32G071RB. LQFP64 package, which is uh, present on a nuclear board. Our project name uh, could be, for example, G0 ADC DMA. And I would use uh, C language, executable binary file, and the project type STM32 cube. I would keep uh, the rest uh, as a default settings. Let's wait a minute. Uh, here the device configuration would be started. Okay, we've got the device configuration window. Uh, in front of us there is our microcontroller and uh, it's uh, it's pin out. Uh, so let's start uh, uh, from selecting the debug interface. So I go to system core, assess and uh, seri serial wire. I can see PA13 and 14 selected as uh, debug interfaces. Then uh, let's select the analog uh, channel. So I go to analog section, ADC1. I scroll down to select the inter internal temperature sensor. We cannot see any change on the pinout because it's internal. And I need to put some configuration for the ADC. So let's go to the parameter settings uh, first and uh, let's select, uh, let's select uh, some basic uh, settings. Uh, we will keep uh, the clock prescaler to synchronous clock uh, mode divided by two. It means that um, our uh, ADC would be clocked by the system clock uh, divided by two. Our system clock uh, is uh, HSI 16 megahertz, which we can verify in a clock configuration. So this is this this is our system clock, 16 megahertz, and ADC clock modes, uh, it is this one. This, uh, this selector, it is used for the ADC clock. Uh, at the moment we can see that it's clocked by the system clock. And additionally, we are 
dividing this clock by uh, 2. It means that IDC would be clocked by 8 MHz, which is important to select the proper uh, sampling time uh, parameters. Let's go further. We need to set uh, the sampling time for selected channel. We've got two sampling times, in fact. Uh, we can select two uh, different uh, sampling times for two different uh, groups of channels which be, would be sampled. In our case, there would be only one channel which would use, uh, for example, sampling, sampling time uh, common one. By default, uh, there is a smallest possible value there. It's 1.5 uh, clock cycles, uh, which is uh, far too fast for our temperature sensor, but uh, to have the exact value we need to uh, go to uh, the documentation of our uh, microcontroller. How to reach uh, documentation to our mi microcontroller? In the meantime I have opened uh, datasheet uh, for our STM32G071 uh, microcontroller. Let's try uh, to find uh, the proper value of the sampling time of our temperature sensor. For this purpose, uh, we'll have a look into, into the electrical characteristics and operating conditions. From within this list, uh, there should be one chapter concerning temperature sensors characteristics, like, like here. Within this chapter, we can see some basic characteristics of our temperature sensor. On the next page, we can find uh, the sampling time uh, for this temperature sensor, which is set as a minimum 5 microseconds, which is the 5 microseconds. Having this uh, 5 uh, microseconds as a minimum sampling time requested for internal temperature sensor, and uh, knowing that uh, our ADC would be clocked by 8 MHz, we can calculate easily that uh, we need at least 40 clock cycles of uh, this 8 MHz clock uh, to properly sample our ADC channel temperature sensor. Let's uh, have a look uh, which value would be the most uh, proper one. We do not have uh, 40 clock cycles, we've got 39.5 which is below this minimum value. This is why we'll select the next one, so 79.5 clock uh, cycles as a sampling time. We are leaving the, uh, the sampling time common to uh, not touched, as so we will not use it. We will have uh, only one conversion, which is the temperature sensor, and uh, we need to specify as well the trigger conversion source. By default it is software, uh, we will change it uh, to uh, timer2, trigger out, and uh, we we'll select one of the edges. We can keep it like, uh, like this. Let's scroll down the rank 1, which is the information about our channel. So we can see uh, it is uh, one channel, it is its name, it's a temperature sensor and its sampling time it's 79.5 clock cycles, which is the value we would like to, uh, to have. We keep uh, the rest of the parameters not touched because we will not uh, use them. The next point uh, would be to uh, configure the DMA which would be used to transfer the data from ADC to internal buffer within SRAM. So let's go to the DMA settings. There is nothing at the moment, so we click Add. We select the channel. There is only one DMA request, ADC1. We have uh, more than one channel available because please remember that stm 32 g 0 contains DMA MOOCs, which allows us to select uh, different uh, DMA uh, channels for different peripherals. We've got uh, a lot of possibilities here. Let's select the default uh, configuration. Uh, the direction would be from peripheral to memory, because we will take the data from ADC and transfer them into the buffer within the SRAM. There would be only one DMA transfer, so let's keep the priority on the low level. Um, we will use only single uh, set of the conversions, uh, so let's keep a mode uh, normal. It means that uh, after the last conversion, mm, the DMA transfer would be stopped, uh, and uh, we will stop on the last uh, on the last uh, component within the buffer. A data width, uh, let's uh, keep uh, as a half word because we will transfer 12-bit data and uh, we would increment uh, the address on memory side. 
the rest of the parameters we will keep uh, not touched. So that's it uh, for ADC configuration. Next step would be the configuration of the timer, which would trigger our ADC uh, conversions. So let's go to the timers, timer tool, and uh, let's select uh, the clock source for this timer as an internal clock. We will not use uh, any, any channels uh, because uh, uh, we will use only time base, so the overflows of the timer to trigger uh, the ADC and these ADC conversions. So let's uh, switch to the to the configuration, and um, we need uh, to set uh, somehow the configuration of the timer to uh, trigger our ADC with the frequency of one hertz. How to configure our timer to work uh, with the frequency of 1 Hz on the output and trigger our ADC with this frequency. Let's have a look on the clock configuration once again. We see that uh, our system clock is uh, configured in, on 16 MHz, which is uh, transferred uh, to all of the peripherals. As we can see, our timer clock is as well 16 MHz. So we need uh, to divide somehow this 16 MHz in such a way to have 1 Hz at the end. Let's come back to the pinout configuration. And um, we've, got, uh, uh, we've got here a few possibilities. I would propose uh, the following uh, technique. Let's use a prescaler, which is 16-bit value, to divide the clock as a first step. So I would propose uh, to divide it by 16,000. It is important to put here the value, uh, which is the desired value, minus 1, due to the fact that in the final calculation there is one added to the value stored in this PSC part of the register. After this operation, we will have as an input clock to the timer, to its counter, 1 kilohertz. So we need to divide this uh, 1 kilohertz somehow to have 1 hertz. To do this, uh, we are using uh, this counter period, which will be set to 1000. Uh, I put uh, the value 999 due to the fact that we are calculating from zero. So after this, uh, those two operations, uh, our timer would uh, overflow uh, with the frequency of 1 hertz, which is the desired, uh, desired uh, uh, value. This is the first part of the configuration of the timer. So we will have a timer which would overflow in the frequency of 1 Hz. Second step is to configure the trigger output, TRGO uh, pin uh, parameters. So the next point is to select properly the trigger output parameters. So first uh, we need to enable this master-slave mode uh, to enable uh, triggering uh, another peripherals like ADC by this timer, and then select the source of this uh, trigger output signal. Uh, so we will change this reset, which is default value, to update event, and on each overflow of the timer we will have a trigger pulse to uh, start a new conversion by uh, ADC. That's all operations uh, within the device configuration. We can generate the code. So I can simply save the project, so Control s Yes. After a while a project is generated. So we can go to our main.c file, which is the main file of our, our code. OK, so we can see it is uh, initially pre-configured. All of the peripherals we just configured within the device configuration are initialized. What is missing is a calibration of ADC, then its start and the final configuration of its connection to DMI, and then as a final step, start of a timer tool, which would uh, trigger the ADC conversions. So let's uh, do it step by step. Let's start from definition of the buffer we will use to store the ADC uh, data. So the first uh, thing would be the definition of its maximum size. So I would call it as ADC buff size and I would set it to 8. Uh, please have a look that I'm 
putting the code within the user code sections just to be sure that uh, after the code regeneration uh, from the device configuration my uh, code would be not uh, deleted. Uh, so the next step would be the, the buffer itself. The buffer will be used to store the 12-bit data uh, so we, we will use a 16-bit uh, size of its uh, basic component and then let's name it ADC buffer and its uh, size will set to this uh, define which we have defined a bit before. Okay, so this is the first step, definition of the data where we will store the uh, temperature values. Okay, so next step uh, would be to calibrate uh, IDC. Uh, calibration is needed to remove the offset error and it should be run on each uh, power on of the application so just after the uh, reset in our case. Uh, for this we've got a dedicated function within, within the HAL, so if I would uh, use uh, HAL ADC EX, EX means uh, extended, it is special marking uh, for the functions within the HAL, which uh, means that uh, this particular function may differ from other similar functions uh, on different uh, different STM32 lines. If you do not see an ex uh, as a suffix in the function name, it means that this function can be copy-pasted across the families without any change. In case of ADCs, uh, these calibration functions may differ from family to family. This is why we've got this ex a suffix at the end. Okay, so we, we need to select the proper function, calibration start, then uh, the first argument, the only argument is uh, ADC1 handler, and that's it. To be sure that this calibration has been done properly, I would check it. So I would check whether this function has been executed correctly. If it's executed correctly, it should return the value HAL OK. So I would use simple if and then if uh, okay so if it's not equal it should execute the error handler function. This error handler function is uh, automatically generated by Cubemix as well. You can find it at the bottom of this. Uh, of this file. This function is defined uh, as, a, an, as an empty function, so you can put here an action which would be triggered in case of any problems with uh, HAL functions execution. Let's back to our uh, coding. Uh, so our ADC is uh, calibrated. ADC is calibrated. Then the next step uh, would be to start uh, ADC. So let's, uh, let's have a look for the options we've got. ADC Start and we've got three options. We've got start, start DMA, start IT. Start uh, is a full polling mode. Uh, start IT is with usage of interrupts, and start DMA is with usage with cooperation with DMA. So we are selecting this option, and we need uh, to specify three arguments. The first one is a handler to ADC we are using. So this is ADC H ADC one. Then uh, there is a pointer to the buffer where the data should be stored and length of this buffer. So the first argument is a pointer, then there should be the buffer name, so ADC buffer, and its length. And again, uh, it would be good to check whether this function is executed correctly as well. This is why I'm adding this part of the code. Okay, and the last operation to start the process is to start the timer 2. To start the timer 2, we need to execute uh, the HAL function from a timer module, which would start the time base. Time base means that uh, uh, we are using only the counter and its uh, overflows without uh, any action connected to input or output channels. So in our case uh, we've got again start uh, 
time base uh, start, start DMA, start IT. We don't care about the IT or DMA usage for the timer. So we are selecting the first function, the simplest one. The only argument we need to put here is a handler to this timer. So there is only one, timer two. And again, let's be sure that everything is correct with this function execution. This is why I'm adding this uh, checkup. Okay, and we are done. So this is the basic uh, uh, piece of the code to start uh, our ADC conversion with usage of DMA and triggering uh, by the timer, uh, timer 2. The source of the trigger has been done in a device configuration. In the code, uh, we need to first do the calibration of ADC and then specify the buffer and its size and start both uh, peripherals. Okay, so the missing point is to process the interrupt, which is related to our DMA transfer complete. The interrupt uh, call, it is managed uh, within the stm32g0xx underscore it dot c file where we will find uh, DMA1 channel 1 IRQ handler. This function is automatically generated by uh, the device configuration by uh, stm 32 cube IDE and um, it is calling uh, the function HAL DMA IRQ handler from our device. Uh, the HAL library is built in such a way that if we are using a DMA, usually it is assigned to one of the peripherals, uh, there is a link uh, created between DMI and the peripheral with uh, which uh, DMI is working. So in such a case, uh, instead of uh, calling the callbacks uh, from the peripheral, in our case ADC, can be used instead. So what we need to do, it is defined within the halmsp.c file. If we go uh, to ADC MSP init function, you can see that uh, there is a configuration of DMA channel and uh, there is a macro called, called HAL underscore link DMA, which is connecting our ADC uh, with a DMA handler. And uh, it's connecting, in fact, uh, the callbacks uh, from ADC, which should be used uh, normally by its interrupts, to callbacks uh, with callbacks from a DMA. As a result, we can reuse uh, the, for example, ADC conversion complete callback from ADC as a final result of DMA transfer complete. Uh, knowing this, uh, we can add uh, the function within our main.c file. User code uh, uh, for a section is very good uh, for this. And we are adding the new uh, code. So AJL uh, ADC conversion complete callback And uh, within this callback, uh, we can either stop ADC in DMA mode or timer two to not trigger uh, ADC uh, anymore. So I would stop. Uh, I will stop uh, ADC. So I'm selecting the function call ADC stop, and again we've got a DMA option, and percent uh, and one. I'm checking whether this function is properly executed. If not, I will call error handler. Okay, so this uh, will give us only the, the option to really stop uh, the ADC operations once the buffer is full. In the next step, uh, we will try to post-process those data. So let's uh, s finish this uh, project at the moment. Uh, let's try to compile it.
As a next step, we will connect our board and try to run the debug session. And let's observe what would be the result which we can gain uh, in the IDC buffer. Okay, I have my board uh, connected. The code is compiled. Let's try after connection of the board to run the debug session. So let's go to the debug session. I run it. The application will switch uh, to the debug perspective. Now I can uh, have a look on uh, the buffer. As you can see, now I can have a look on its uh, value, current value, the base address, the type of it. So at the moment it contains only zeros. Uh, please remember that uh, our conversion will uh, last uh, 8 seconds. We've got a buffer which size is 8 elements and the frequency of the trigger is 1 Hz. It gave us 8 seconds. To be sure that we are just at the end of the conversion, let's put our breakpoint in a callback, which would be triggered in case of DMA transfer complete. Okay, so I starting the execution of the code. Let's wait 8 seconds, more or less. Okay, execution has is finished at the moment. So now we can have a look on the on the buffer. So we can, for example, highlight it in this in this area, and. Uh, you see that the values are not the temperature ones. We need to convert it to the temperature. Right now it's a pure reading uh, from ADC, it's a row value. It's, it needs to be uh, to be converted. Uh, for this uh, we need a reference uh, voltage value, which is in our case the power supply of the board, which is 3.3 volts. And uh, we've got a special macro which can be used here to convert this value into the Celsius decrease. So now we will do this process. Okay, so the next uh, step would be to specify the flag, which would be used uh, to uh, highlight uh, when there is a time to the conversion of the data. I would go into user code uh, section for the private variable and I would create one variable which is 8 bit uh, long and I would call it flag with initial value set to uh, 0. Then uh, I would uh, set this flag within our uh, DMA transfer complete, flag set to 1, and uh, based on this uh, value I would uh, trigger the uh, post-processing of ADC data within while one loop. So I would create here the if uh, loop so if a flag is uh, equal to 1, we will do some uh, post-processing uh, and at the end, of course, we need to clear uh, the flag to not do the same operations all the time. Okay, let's try to find a function which would convert our data, uh, but before this uh, we will specify uh, the index which would be used uh, to convert the data from the buffer one by one. I would use the simplest possible uh, variable 8 bit because we've got only 8 uh, bit uh, data. IDX, uh, I would uh, set the default, default value as a 0. And then we would create here the simple uh, for loop. For IDX equal to 0, then IDX less than IDC buff size. and idx++. Okay, so it would create a simple uh, for a loop. Let's find the function or macro which would convert our uh, ADC row data into the temperature in Celsius decrease. A lot of such functions are stored uh, within low layer modules for given peripheral. So let's start uh, from this uh, underscore, underscore low layer, which is the common name of the macros very useful macros to do simple operations. Then the peripheral name like ADC underscore and control space. We can see here an um, interesting macro ADC calc temperature. It looks uh, that it is something we are looking for. As a first argument it needs uh, reference uh, analog voltage which has been used for the ADC. 
then the raw data from ADC and resolution we have used during our measurements. Uh, let's have a closer look on this macro. So I would uh, click right uh, button on mouse and uh, open declaration. So the first argument is analog reference voltage in millivolts. So I would define this name within my my code uh, in a section uh, private defines over here. I have measured this value, it's 3.3 .3 volts. In millivolts it would be 3300. And I would use this as a first argument of our macro. Okay, let's uh, go to the second. Second argument is um, conversion data measured by ADC. So this is our buffer. Our buffer is, this is the name of our buffer. And uh, of course we need a single element. So IDX and the third argument was the resolution. We have used 12 bits, so I will select the resolution 12 bits like this. And uh, of course we need to store the value in the buffer again. So we will just replace the old values, row values, with the new ones in the Celsius decrease. Okay, let's try to compile the code. And start the debug session. Okay, let's, um, as a first point, let's remove the breakpoint from our uh, callback. I already did it, uh, so we don't need it in this place. We would need instead the callback in our while one loop uh, on the place when the flag would be cleared, which means that uh, it should be triggered once the conversion, uh, the, con the, the conversion to the Celsius decrease is done. Okay, I double click on this line and I run the conversion. So first it would convert eight uh, data uh, from the temperature and sensor and then uh, it will land in th this part of the code and convert it to the Celsius decrease. Okay, we are, we are already there. Uh, so I would just highlight our ADC buffer and please have a look right now, instead of 900 something, we've got a value in the Celsius decrease. Please remember that this value is a temperature uh, of the silicon of the structure uh, within the microcontroller. It is not uh, the ambient temperature, it is the structure temperature. This is why it can be a bit higher than uh, what we feel, what we've got uh, in our environment. Okay, we can terminate uh, the session and that's it for this module. Thank you for watching this video. STM32Cube IDE Basics training session. In this section, uh, I will demonstrate how to use uh, USART uh, to send the data and how to uh, visualize it uh, using the terminal, which is built in within the STM32Cube IDE tool. So the objectives of uh, this part are the following. I will demonstrate how to configure the USART tool in unsynchronous mode to send the data and then uh, how we can reuse existing connection between USART tool of our microcontroller from the Nucleo board to ST-Link and uh, then to use a virtual COM port uh, on PC to, to communicate with the, with the micro. And then uh, we will reuse uh, existing uh, built-in terminal application, which uh, is a part of STM32Cube uh, ID. Uh, let's start uh, from STM32Cube uh, IDE new project uh, creation. Uh, I would reuse uh, an existing uh, workspace, uh, which contains already several projects. I would create a new one uh, for our micro, so I go to File, New stm32 project and now i'm waiting for the uh, target selection window 
I'm selecting STM32G071 RB microcontroller. Uh, so uh, it's enough to type uh, G071 RB. This is this one, and uh, we are selecting LQFP64 package version. So I create, click uh, next, then the name of the project. Uh, I would propose uh, G0 uh, USART, and I uh, will select uh, C as a target language. Um, I would like to generate the executable binary type, <coughs> and we will use STM32Cube and uh, its device configuration to create the skeleton of the application. Let's uh, click Finish uh, to start a device configuration window, which is in fact STM32 CubeMix, built in uh, with an STM32 Cube IDE uh, complete environment. So we see on the left side uh, that our new project is already created, G0 USART. It's an empty skeleton. Uh, so now we can see the complete pinout of our micro. Nothing is connected yet. So let's start uh, from connection of the debug interface. So system core sys serial wire. We see that uh, two pins has been already assigned. So this is the uh, first point. Uh, then uh, we need to connect uh, uh, USART 2, which is uh, connected internally to the S-Link. So we go to the connectivity. USART 2, we select asynchronous mode, and then we see that uh, PA2 and PA3 are assigned to USART 2 TX and RX functions, and uh, those two pins are connected to ST-Link on the ST link USART, and then are visible uh, with a virtual COM port on PC once we connect our nuclear port uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to, to PC. Okay, so uh, we've got a connection to USART, and now we can configure our USART uh, parameters. So let's configure the, the parameters. I would propose to keep uh, 115,000 uh, bits per second as a bit rate. A work length, uh, it's including parity. I would use uh, 8 bits, and uh, let's use even parity. Let's keep uh, stop bits uh, to 1 as a default, uh, default uh, settings. Uh, we will not uh, do any additional configuration, so we can generate the project. I will just save the projects by Ctrl S. So there is a question whether we would like to generate the code. I would click remember my decision and select yes. On the left part of the screen, we can see that our template is filled uh, with newly generated uh, source files. Okay, so now we need to uh, go into the source uh, and the main.c file, which is the main uh, file containing the, uh, the sources which are executed after the reset. And uh, within the main procedure, uh, we can see that we've got uh, some uh, initial configuration within the hull in it, then the clock configuration, which we kept as a default setting. Uh, so our system is clocked by HSI, so high-speed internal oscillator, which is 16 megahertz. And uh, then we've got the initialization of the GPIOs and our USART uh, 2. What we need to do right now, we need to transmit in some area data uh, over the USART. So to do this, uh, I would use our while one loop where I would put the function from USART uh, domain. So call underscore UART control space. And now I can see a lot of functions which are typical for G0 family, those with suffix ex, but uh, I would select something typical, something easy. Uh, so I would like to transmit something without any IT, without any DMA, so I would select just simple how you are to transmit. The first argument is a handler to do what we would like to use, then the pointer to the data we would like to send, then the size of those data, and the timeout in milliseconds we would like to wait till the function will complete. Uh, so the first one will be UART2. The second one, instead of the buffer, I would just specify the name. It would be test, oops, sorry, test, space, and the size, uh, it's uh, for it's five letters plus uh, the end. Uh, of the of the string, so it will be six, 
and the timeout let's uh, put uh, for example 100 milliseconds okay to be sure that uh, the function would be co would be executed correctly without any errors uh, i would propose to check its return value and in case of any trouble let's call the function which is already generated its error handler uh, it is uh, it can be called in all of the cases when the hal function is uh, returning value different from hal okay which is the proper execution of the of the hal function <laughs> okay so i use if then it's not equal hal okay then execute error i will just correct the typing okay to not block our our microcontroller i would use some delay function at the end i'll delay let's uh, put here 500 milliseconds to make this uh, string display uh, visible okay so this is all uh, from the coding side uh, let's try to compile the code so i would build it Okay, and now let's try to run a debug session. I select STM32 MCUC C++ application. This is the time I can change something, some configuration within the debug. I keep the default settings. And now I will switch to um, the debug uh, perspective. Now we need to turn on the terminal window. And now being in a console window, now we are in a debug perspective, so we can see uh, the dedicated debug uh, tab with a resume, pause, so suspend and terminate a debug uh, session. Uh, in the in the bottom, we can see the window uh, with a set of tabs. Uh, so console, registers, memory, outputs. Mm, we can set uh, more registers, tabs. Uh, and uh, important is uh, to select the console window, console tab. If you do not see any console, you can go to the window, show view, and console. Within the console tab, you need to go to the open console and select the command shell console. Then select serial port, select new, uh, select uh, any connection uh, type. So I would select test test g0 then a serial port which has been assigned to your nucleo port in my case it is com31 baud rate like set in our configuration within the device configuration so it was 115000 data size it it was set to 8 including parity so i would set to 7 because we are using even parity and the stop bits is 1 i click finish I can select as well the encoding, one of the three options we've got here. But I do not use any special characters, so I use the default setting. And then I press OK. So I can see that my terminal is connected. Now, if I run the application by pressing the resume button, I can see once per half a second the text I would like to display. Uh, now uh, I can disconnect the terminal, just pressing this icon. I can connect it once again, it will con continue. Uh, please be careful, once you disconnect the terminal and then you forget to close uh, close uh, the, uh, the console. Because in this case, if you try to create a new terminal application, it will be not possible. It will be not possible because uh, there is already open connection uh, on different name, on the same uh, serial port. Thank you for watching this video. to cube IDE basics training session. In this module I would demonstrate to you how to add the FreeRTS middleware software to the project based on STM32 microcontrollers using STM32 cube IDE. So the objectives for this part are the following. 
First, we'll configure to IOS uh, PI5 as a GPIO output to control green LED and PC13 as a GPIO XT13 to monitor the blue button which is connected, connected to the port. Then uh, we will add the freer TOS middleware to our existing project and uh, within this freer TOS uh, I would add two tasks and one binary semaphore uh, which would be controlled by our blue button. Let's start uh, with the new project uh, on STM32Cube IDE. I would use an existing uh, workspace when I've got already some ready projects. I'm creating the new project, uh, so I go to File, New, STM32 Projects. It will start uh, from the uh, device, uh, device selector. I'm selecting uh, STM32G071RB microcontroller version LQFP64, which is used on our Nucleo board. I press next, and then name of the projects I propose G0, G0, free RTOS. I select the target language as a C, binary type executable, and we will use STM32 cube to uh, as a project type. I press finish, and now we will be switched to the device configuration uh, window. Okay, uh, so let's start uh, uh, from enabling the debug uh, interface pins. So I go into the system uh, core uh, sys serial wire. I can see that both pins are selected as a uh, debug uh, interface ones. Uh, second uh, step is a proper configuration of our IOs we'll use. The first one is a PA5 when we've got our green LED connected. If I would uh, put into the search PA5, uh, I can see a blinking uh, PA5 uh, pins just to find it more easily. Uh, I press left button on this uh, pin and I'm selecting GPIO output. Uh, then I need to specify its label just to have a, a more easy configuration within the coding process. So I press the right button on mouse, selecting enter user label and uh, I would uh, name it as a uh, LED green. The next step uh, is a configuration uh, of our pin connected to the blue uh, button. It is PC13. So again, left button on mouse. And this time we will select GPIO XT13 because it would be an external interrupt. Please do not worry on this red uh, highlight over here. It means that uh, we have used this pin, uh, so it will be not available for other functionalities like System Wake Up 2. If I would go with the mouse over this red uh, component, I should see the information. What is the reason of highlighting this pin? There is nothing to be worried at the moment. We come back to our pin and over this pin we click the right button on mouse and select User Label. We will name it as a blue button. Okay, so this is um, the second component. So from hardware point of view, we create, we configured all of the peripherals. So we go to the middleware, free RTOS, and we can select the interface. At the moment uh, for the G0 family, there is only CMC's V1 library uh, available. This CMC's V1 means that uh, over the original free RTOS API, we've got the additional layer which is called CMC's OS. So we select uh, CMC's uh, V1 and uh, within the configuration window we can see a lot of a lot of new tabs related to freer tests. First two, I mean uh, config parameters and include parameters are important because uh, it's uh, in fact creating the a skeleton of the operating uh, system and uh, it's it reflects uh, the main configuration file within the FreeRTOS, which is freertos.config.h file. Using uh, config parameters, uh, we can select the type of the kernel, whether it will be it will use preemption or not. Uh, we can specify the tick rate, maximum number of the priorities of the tasks, then minimum stack size. Uh, for the component, please be aware that it's given in words. Then the maximum task name length, 
and 16 signs. Then we can enable or disable some additional functionalities like mutexes, record shift mutexes, counting semaphores, a tickless mode, uh, which is used for low power applications. We will not uh, change anything in this area. Uh, important component is a memory management settings. Uh, where we are specifying the total RAM memory area which would be used for the freer OS. Please be aware that this time it is given in bytes, uh, so 3 kilobytes we've got at the moment, and the memory management scheme. Uh, we can select uh, this memory management scheme from HIP1 to HIP5. Uh, we've got a dedicated session on the freer OS uh, within our channel, so you can have a look for more details on each uh, memory management schemes. The most uh, flexible one is, uh, in fact, uh, HIP4. If you would like to use the HIP memory, which would be allocated on different RAM areas, please have a look on the HIP5 instead. It will be not our case, so I would select the most popular one, HIP4. Then uh, the important point uh, is uh, the last two uh, parameters. The first one is uh, library lowest interrupt priority. Those two components are used to properly cooperate uh, with the interrupts which are present in the microcontroller world. The first one, library lowest interrupt priority, is the lowest possible interrupt priority which is available in the in this particular microcontroller. As it is a Cortex M0+, Plus, the lowest possible priority is free. And this lowest interrupt priority is used uh, for the interrupts related to the context switch and the tick interrupt used by the operating system. To be sure that all of the hardware interrupts are processed in proper way, operating system uh, is operating on the lowest possible priorities, just not to interfere with uh, hardware events. Uh, so this is the lowest possible priority for the system itself. The second parameter is used uh, to set the maximum interrupt of the priorities, which can still execute the functions of operating system. Please remember that in uh, Cortex-M uh, devices uh, lowest uh, priority means highest number. So in this case I would propose a small change. Instead of three we will put two. So the task switching and the tick interrupt would uh, have uh, lowest possible priority, number three while uh, interrupts, uh, which we would like still to execute the operating system functions, would have uh, interrupt uh, priority two. Other interrupts, uh, which we would like uh, to be completely independent from the operating system, uh, will have uh, interrupt priority zero. So in this case, uh, all the hardware interrupts would be not interrupted by the operating system. So this is the basic configuration of the operating system. Let me remind you that all of the operations, all the configurations we are doing it here, would be stored later on in a free RTOS config.h file, which is the main configuration file of the free RTOS. The next file is used to include uh, some additional functionalities, some additional functions to the operating system. This is used to add uh, some additional functions to the operating system. The drawback of uh, adding new functions is that uh, we would use, uh, we would use uh, some additional code uh, space. Uh, so if it's not necessary, we can remove some uh, functions to save some code space. We will not uh, use any additional, additional new. We will keep everything as a default setting uh, at the moment. The next, uh, next point is to add two tasks. We go to the task and queues tab. At the moment we've got only one task, it is so-called default task, which is created automatically. We will change this default task to our task 1. Just double-click using uh, left button and mouse on this name and uh, you should see the edit window. So we will change the default task name into the task 1. Uh, we will keep uh, OS priority normal. We've got seven types of uh, priorities, uh, starting from priority idle, which is the lowest possible, and uh, ending with uh, so-called real-time. Normally, so uh, somehow in the middle. So let's use uh, priority normal for both tasks. Uh, stack size, uh, it's uh, set on 128 uh, words, so let's keep it like this. Entry function, which is the uh, function which would be called during the task execution. 
Uh, so instead of this uh, start default task, I would use something different. Just task one underscore app from application. The rest I keep uh, as a default. So this is the task one, and I would add task two just pressing this add button. And again, I've got a new task, so I change the name task two. Uh, priority normal. Uh, stack size the same without change, 128 words. And uh, the function would be task to up. And okay. We've got two tasks defined uh, with the same priority uh, with different functions which would be called during its uh, execution. So this is, uh, this is the point number one. Now let's add this uh, one binary semaphore which uh, would be connected to our uh, external interrupt triggered by the blue button. To do this, uh, we need to uh, go into the timers and semaphores tab, and uh, we need to select uh, the binary semaphore. So below this binary semaphore empty space, we've got the add button. So again, we need to add some binary semaphore. We will change this name into the binary underscore sem allocation dynamic we've got as well in some areas static if we configure the settings of the operating system we can uh, as well use the static memory allocation please have a look that uh, for example in case of the timers and counting semaphores we cannot add anything uh, options are uh, not accessible due to the fact that uh, within the config uh, parameters we have not enabled those components uh, please have a look uh, if I would come back to the config parameters and I would scroll down. Uh, I would scroll down and uh, I would select use timers from disabled to enabled and then come back to timers and semaphores, timers became accessible. Okay, let me change it to disable uh, uh, again. Okay, so we are done. Uh, with all of the settings of uh, operating system from this uh, device configuration window. Let's try to generate the code. I would just save uh, save the, the project. And please have a look. I've got a warning. I've got a warning telling me that uh, I should change the time-based source uh, for HAL library from Sysdig which is the default setting, uh, to some other timer. This is done due to the fact that Sysdig uh, is used uh, by the operating system, FreeRTOS, as a tick uh, timer. And it should not be mixed uh, with the HAL library usage, because in HAL, uh, Sysdig is used uh, to generate all of the delay functions and timeouts, and it should not be mixed up. Okay, so this is highly recommended to change the time-based timer for the HAL library. We can use it within the sys, system core and sys tab. And uh, here at the last point, we've got the time-based source. I can select any of the timers which are available in the system. Uh, what I would recommend to you is to use either timer 6 or timer 7. Both of those timers uh, contains only the time base uh, component, uh, so they can generate um, the interrupt on overflow. And those timers uh, do not have any input nor output channels. So the potential loss would be uh, minimum in this case. I would select timer six and uh, please have a look if uh, now I would go into the timer six, uh, the timers sections, I can see timer six unaccessible inaccessible because it has been used as a time base for our application. Okay, let's try to generate the code once again. So I would uh, control, uh, I would just save the project. And now on the left side, we should see uh, switches. The project would be generated. We can see that middlewares folder has been added. Uh, if I would scroll it down, I can see the subfolder third party, then FreeRTOS source, and then below uh, you can see the, the main file is alista.c, which is in fact the, the main file uh, which contains the functions 
uh, related to the scheduler, which is the heart, the core of the operating system. Then the semaphores uh, and the queues are stored, the functions for these are stored within the queue.c file. Uh, all of our tasks uh, are stored within the task.c uh, file. Timers is used for the timer semaphore. Uh, then we've got additionally the stream buffer. Uh, we've got uh, event groups uh, to communicate uh, between the uh, between the tasks and coroutines, which are not used in our architecture. Coroutines are used in uh, 8-bit or 16-bit architecture and requires less resources uh, from the uh, embedded system. Uh, in our case, we will use uh, full version, so we will use tasks, uh, so this uh, file will be not used. So this is the core, it is completely independent uh, from the embedded system, from the application, from the system when, where it has been added. The connection between our hardware, our STM32G0 and um, FreeRTOS is done uh, within the portable folder. Here we can see GCC and memory management folders. In memory management folder, we can see only one file, uh, one file with the name uh, which has been selected in the device configuration. And this uh, heap underscore 4.c file contains the functions to allocate and deallocate the memory, the RAM memory, for operating system uh, components. Uh, so this is strictly related to the to the hardware, and then within the GCC we've got subfolder ARM CM0, so it's uh, for our uh, core, which is the, the, the heart of our STM32 G0. Uh, inside we can see two uh, files, port.c and port macro.h. Those two files contain the functions, which are connecting the interrupts uh, from the real hardware. Uh, with uh, the functions from the operating system. So this is the real interface between the embedded system which we are using and the operating system we have just added. We will not modify any of those files. All of the modifications of the code which we will do should be done within one of the two uh, files. The first one is app underscore free RTS and main.c uh, file. If we go into the main.c file, we can see it as a standard uh, cube ID or cubemix generated file with some add-ons uh, related to uh, used operating uh, system. So we can uh, see within the private function prototypes, for example, uh, the two functions which would be called uh, when the task 1 or task 2 would be executed. So those names has been defined by us within the task configuration, task tasks add-on uh, within the configuration of the free RTS in a device uh, configurator. So within the main you can see that uh, we're starting with HAL init, call configuration, GPIO init, and all the peripherals which we would like to init uh, would be in this area. Then below we can see the preparation of um, the components of the operating system which we have added. So for example, binary semaphore, uh, tasks, and uh, at the end of this process, uh, we've got one single function to, to start the scheduler. It is OS kernel start. After this call, only the tasks which are active uh, would be executed one by one, and we sh should never land below this line. If we land below this line, we've got some problems uh, with the uh, RAM memory allocation. Uh, if we go below, we can see both uh, task uh, application functions defined as empty uh, functions with an infinite loop inside because uh, tasks functions should be defined in such a way that it contains the infinite loop inside as a mini main uh, functions. This is how it looks like and now this is the time uh, to add some code uh, modification into our generated code. Now let's back to the NVIC settings. Before we will generate the code, uh, let's have a look on the NVIC, uh, so interrupt uh, configuration. So within the system core NVIC, I can see some new settings. So we've got, I've got a new uh, column over here, uses free RTOS function, which means that uh, I can select which interrupt uh, would be allowed to call the functions of our operating system. 
As we can see from this configuration, the lowest possible priority, so number three, is assigned to two interrupt uh, procedures. The first one is a system tick timer, so SysTick, which is used uh, to generate the tick interrupt, and the second one is a pendable request for system service, so pend SV, which is uh, used uh, to switch the context uh, from one task uh, to the other. Both of them have the lowest possible priority, to do not interfere, to do not block any hardware interrupt within the embedded system. Some of the interrupts uh, have the priority number zero, as you can see. Those are very important ones and should not be blocked by the operating system. So we've got non maskable interrupt, we've got Harfold interrupt, uh, we've got as well time-based interrupt coming from timer 6, which would be used by the HAL library. The rest of the interrupts uh, has been set uh, with the priority number 2, which means that it will be possible to execute the operating system from those interrupt routines. It is visible on this last column over here. If I unclick this, the interrupt priority would change immediately to 0, which means that this function would be above the operating system and uh, this interrupt routine should not interfere with the operating system. I would change it once again. And what we are missing here is, uh, in fact, uh, enabling the interrupt from our blue button, so XT line 13. I'm enabling this, its priority is 2, so it means that uh, we would like to execute functions from the operating systems from this, uh, from this interrupt. Okay, now we can generate the code. Okay, so let's uh, come back to our coding and let's change the default uh, task application functions. Within the task 1, we would like to turn on green LED and then go to the blocked state for one second. So I would go to this uh, for loop and I would uh, just set the green LED to the high state. Right pin, and then we've got uh, LED, LED green port, and then the pin, LED green pin, and the pin state, GPIO pin set. So this is turning on our green uh, LED, and then we will wait uh, for one second. Please have a look that I'm not using uh, HAL delay, but OS delay. The difference is that HAL delay would block us for one second within this function, while OS delay is um, changing the state of our task uh, from running mode to the blocked uh, one, which allows uh, operating system to switch to the other task, which has some job to be done within this, uh, this time. So this is uh, not wasting any time. Operating system is immediately uh, changing the active task from our, uh, which is going to blocked state uh, to the other, which is much more uh, efficient. So this is the step uh, number uh, one. Step number two uh, would be to do the similar operation with uh, task number two, but in task number two, we will just switch off the task, the, the LED, and this time we will do some modification of OS delay, just not to, to be the same time. So I'm um, uh, sw switching it off and waiting uh, for some uh, time. Come back to GPIO configuration. After configuring the GPIOs and uh, its mode and labels, let's have a look uh, whether we've got the proper configuration of uh, external interrupt uh, input. By default, it is configured as an external interrupt mode uh, with rising edge trigger detection, while uh, in our application the blue button is connected in such a way that it should be active on a falling edge. This is why we need to change it uh, to external interrupt mode with falling edge and trigger uh, detection. We will do the following uh, modification. Instead of using uh, 
OS delay function uh, within the task uh, one, we will go into the blocked state uh, waiting for the semaphore. So I would command this line and instead of this uh, I would wait uh, for the semaphore. So I would uh, use the function OS semaphore control space and then wait. We've got the binary sem handle semaphore and milliseconds. I would put, use here the value OS wait forever. Uh, OS wait forever is in fact, if we have a look, uh, it's in fact the maximum value for 32-bit uh, variable. And uh, how it is how it is working? This function is uh, sending our task into the blocked state, inactive blocked state, uh, for the time uh, till the semaphore will come, will be released, or the timeout will collapse. In this case, uh, it will be quite long. This is why this is OS wait forever. So we will uh, we will wait uh, till the, the semaphore would be released. And uh, where we should uh, release the uh, semaphore? To release the semaphore, we need to go for a while into the g0 underscore itc.c file, where we will find the external interrupt routine for our uh, microcontroller. I can find this function within the halgpio.c uh, file. And I can see that uh, a HAL library is clearing all the flags. And then once the flag is cleared, it's calling the proper callback. Uh, as we are uh, working with this external interrupt on falling edge, this would be the callback uh, which should be used by us. It is defined as an empty function with weak attribute, so we can redefine it within our piece of code. I would copy paste it, and within the main.c file, in this user code begin for user code end for, I would use this callback. Then we can check whether it was exactly the, 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 the pin we were looking for called, so I would put if, and then I would use this blue pin label. So if our variable, so GPIO pin has been this uh, blue button pin, I would release the semaphore. So OS semaphore control space. So we need to release the semaphore. It's like with the traffic lights. Release the semaphore means that uh, I giving something, yes, which can be reused uh, afterwards by other component of the operating system, like task one. So the only argument here is a handler for this semaphore, this one, and that's it. One more thing uh, on this on this point. Using this callback, uh, executing code within this callback is still done within the uh, interrupt routine of uh, external interrupt uh, from line 13. This is an important point uh, because uh, please uh, remember that our hardware interrupts should not interfere with the operating system. The cooperation between uh, hardware interrupts and operating system functions should be done in careful way. The big advantage of the CMC's uh, layer is uh, that the CMC's library is taking care of selecting proper function if we are calling the operating system function from the uh, normal code or from the interrupt routines. If we have a look into this function, if we have a look on this function, this uh, in cmc's os.c, not .h, it is coming unfortunately to the header file, not. We see that uh, it is checking at the beginning uh, if we are in a handler mode, so in the interrupt routine, or we are in a normal code. From uh, interrupt routine, it is calling a different uh, Freer to as API function with from ISR suffix, which is checking whether there was any any component, any task woken up by this event, by this semaphore, and if yes, it is checking whether there is a need to change the context uh, to different uh, task which had, has been just woken up. Uh, so this is an important point that using CMC's OS layer. We don't need to take care about uh, selecting the proper function. It is done automatically by mm, the API. Okay, so uh, coming back to our code, we have just added this semaphore. Let's try to compile the code. 
So now uh, the task one, which is uh, responsible for turning on the LED, uh, would wait uh, for the semaphores for the uh, which would be released by the pressing the button. In the meantime, uh, only the task two, which is turning off the LED, would be active. So now if I will go into the into the debug mode. and run the code. Okay, so we will switch uh, timer assisting to timer 7. Please have a look that timer 7 disappeared from available timers. And now if we save uh, and generate the code, we should have a new file stm32.0xxhal time by time which contains the functions to suspend tick, resume tick, all the functions which are used by the HAL library uh, to generate the timeouts and delay functions. And now if we uh, compile the code of semaphore edit, in the meantime we can have a look on the uh, interrupt SC routine, we see that uh, Timer 7 IRQ handler has been added. We will go to the debug mode. Uh, I start the application. I can see my LED turn on for a while and then turn off because the timer, the, the task 2, is only active. Task 1, which is turning on LED, is not active, waiting for the semaphore, which can be given by the interrupt triggered by the blue button. I press the blue button and for a while. Uh, the green LED is uh, turned on and then turned off because task 2 is uh, taken into, into account. So that's it uh, for, this, uh, for this exercise. Thank you for watching this video.